Hallelujah. God bless you. Welcome to your divine appointment, which is the media ministry of the Devon Jackson MD Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson. We're so glad you're here to start this brand new year. Let me not fail to say happy new year. Welcome to 2022. What a blessing. We're delighted to be here and study these international Sunday school lessons and the first Sunday of January. Hallelujah. We're continuing this study on justice and we bless God for it. We want to let you know that these recordings are available on our multiple uh, uh, social media uh, platforms, including Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn, hallelujah, and Twitter. Uh, we bless God, Facebook, all of these. Uh, you'll see the icons there below, and uh, they are available 24 hours a day on demand to uh, study and restudy the Word of God together. So glad that you've joined us that we can delve into God's word. We have a most exciting lesson to launch this brand new year. And we do wanna let you know that there will be uh, also a new year prayer that will also be available on these platforms. Praise God. But let's pray now as we begin to study. Lord, bless us now, we pray, sweet King, in the study of your word, because we love you and we bless you and we praise you and we glorify you. And we know that your word is a lamp to our feet and it's a light to our path, and we're relying on that lamp and that light to be our God. Sweet Holy Ghost, we're enrolled in Holy Ghost University. Teach us your word. Bless my brothers, sisters, and friends as we study. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Thank God and amen. Certainly, we do hope that your holiday celebrations have been glorious and blessed, and if they weren't, thank God for a brand new day brand new year, and a new start this very hour. We praise God for that. Well, I hope you have your Bible uh, this Sunday, and next we're going to be in the book of beginnings, which is the book of Genesis. A book of Genesis, as we know, opens up the Holy Scriptures in the division that we call the books of Moses, the Pentateuch. Amen. Uh, Pentateuch meaning five volumes because there are five books. Um, these books of the law written by the great lawgiver, Moses. And in today's lesson, we find ourselves dealing with the first family of the earth. Amen. Uh, we know that mom and dad, hallelujah, Eve, uh, Adam and Eve, praise God, our first parents, father and mother. And now we're dealing with uh, their sons, Cain and Abel. Wow. And what a lesson we have today. So let's delve in. Praise God. We find here in chapter 4, we're in verses uh, 1 through 15, and I'll be reading in the King James Version. We open up with a scene that is announcing the birth of the sons, and then very quickly, uh, we go into a scene where they are in a place of worship, and we discover some things going on at the time of the worship service. <laughs> well, let's begin. Verse 1, it says, And Adam uh, knew Eve, his wife, hallelujah, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. This opens up, of course, uh, that Adam and Eve are now sexually intimate and a child is born. And uh, notice that they are husband and wife, shall we say amen? <laughs> Praise God. And uh, so they uh, are intimate and now a child is born. And the first one, it's important to know, is Cain. And then the verse lets us know in verse 2, she again bare his brother and his name is Abel. Hallelujah. And it goes immediately into describing these sons. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Uh, and it's very interesting that the scripture lays out for us from the beginning that they're two sons, they are brothers, but they have different uh, careers. This speaks spiritually as well, that even though we're brothers, brothers and sisters in the family of God, we have different callings, vocations, and assignments in the body of Christ. All of those are valid and significant, but they're not identical they're not the same. Hallelujah. Our physical body teaches us the necessity that there be uh, uh, things that are of equal value, but they have a different function. Hallelujah. We've talked before. We have lungs and we have a heart, 
Well, they're of equal value because if you're without either one of them, we'll be dead. Hallelujah. But their jobs are very different. And here we start out in the first family, the first humans. Here, Cain and Abel have different works that they engage in. Very interestingly, we go into verse 3, and it says, and in the process of time. That's an important phrase for us to see because many in their mind are thinking that uh, Cain and Abel are still uh, uh, children, essentially, and that there's only a handful of people on the earth. We'll see evidence later in this lesson that the earth is well populated by this time. These uh, persons are already men because they are coming to worship. Mom and dad aren't bringing them to worship. They are at worship on their own. And Doubtless, uh, they have uh, children and maybe grandfathers and great-grandfathers and great-great-grandfathers by the time of this lesson. The scripture doesn't specify, but we do know that the earth has been well populated at this particular time. Uh, people at the beginning of time, they lived 800 and 900 and more years. And so because of the length of life, they were able to produce extensively, reproduce extensively, hallelujah, with these long periods of long, these great periods of longevity. So by the time that this occurs, uh, Cain and Abel as two men have come to worship. Let's see what goes on in the worship service. That's in verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought, notice what it says, of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Nothing more specific is said about the character of the offering uh, other than it was of the ground and he brought it. Hallelujah. We see something very different about the description of his brother's worship. Verse 4, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings, mm -hmm. the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. The characteristic of the two gifts is further clarified as we continue that verse. At the bottom of the last part of verse 4 says, and the Lord had respect or received the offering of Abel. It says, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. This is an important principle. In worship, we will be looking at various elements, two particular elements of worship, but we need to know that worship is an act between the individual and the Lord. That is personal worship, that's priority one. When we do it with other persons in the congregation or as a family or as a Bible study group, any other gathering, that's corporate worship. But corporate or body worship is made up of multitudes of persons in personal worship with God. And then the secondary element is the corporate worship. So the vertical is first and then the horizontal. That's important because if our vertical relationship with the Lord is not what it needs to be, then that corporate worship is not going to be what it needs to be. Because only when our hearts are right with God can our hearts then be right with one another. Sometimes the sign that we see that our relationship with God isn't what it should be is that there's trouble in the relationship with one another. That's a symptom of the actual diagnosis, the actual problem is that our relationship with God is not what it needs to be. And God lets us have a symptom so that we can discover that we got a problem so we can come to God, the heavenly doctor, and find out, Lord, what's going on with me? Oh, bless his name. We don't want to ignore the symptoms. And here we find these two coming to worship. Their offerings are not the same because the offerings are of what they have to give. That's not the problem. And many have said Cain didn't have a chance. He didn't have an opportunity. He gave what he could. He couldn't bring sheep because he wasn't a shepherd. Nothing here ever indicates that uh, Cain's problem had to do with his access to uh, uh, the offering to bring to the Lord. The problem had to do with the attitude and the offering. Let's look first at attitude and we'll find that description here. 
in verse 5, we see, we see here where at the end of verse 4, the Lord has respect and receives the offering of Abel and receives Abel himself. That's important for us to know because our relationship is what this is all about. God is not uh, in need of sheep. God's not in need of uh, uh, fruit from the ground because the Bible says in Psalm 24 and 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and the people that dwell in it. Everything is already God's. He's not short of anything. Everything that you and I have, we have it as what the Bible calls a steward. A steward is a manager. We're not the owners. We're just the managers, which is why we have to answer to the owner. Can we say amen? And so since everything is God's, it's how we handle what God has given us that matters. And so first looking at the attitude, and then we'll look at the offering. Look at verse five. But unto Cain and his offering, the Lord did not have respect or did not receive it. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Now, here we see the beginnings of the signs of what's going on with Cain. The Lord begins to exchange and uh, have a conversation with Cain. How sweet of the Lord when he sees that we have a problem in this age by the unction of the Holy Spirit, we're stirred that there's a problem and we need to come to God in prayer and we need to get it straight. Here, the same thing, the Lord reaches out to Cain and begins to engage him in a conversation to help Cain understand what has gone on. But if our heart is hardened against God, we won't respond to the promptings of the Spirit to begin to come to God to get an understanding and we walk in our own way. But that's not the will of God. God's will is that we respond to the moving of the Spirit that is prompting us to come to God and get an understanding. Isaiah 1 and 18, hallelujah, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, hallelujah. Let's come talk to God. Here the Lord reaches out to Cain in this verse, verse six. And the Lord says unto Cain, hallelujah, why are you wroth or why are you angry? Hallelujah. And why is your countenance fallen? First thing we need to know, whatever's going on in our heart, in our emotions, our attitude, or whatever, God knows about it. Hallelujah. And the Lord here inquired, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Look at verse 7. If you do well, hallelujah, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And those that have thought that Cain didn't have an opportunity, we have a double proof here, hallelujah, because the Lord says, Cain, if you had done well, if you had done righteously, if you had come to worship as you should have, wouldn't you too have been accepted? And that lets us know Cain had opportunity. And then the scripture goes on to say, and if you do not well, then sin lies at the door and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shall rule over him. Oh, let's look at this. Now, here we come to this part of it where the Lord is talking about sin lying at the door. It's almost describing sin as would be a ferocious beast, as in a lion. He says, if you had done well, everything would have been fine. But you got to watch out, Cain, because the reason all this is going on is because, and the Lord is talking here, so we know his assessment of the situation is accurate. He says, a, a, a sin lies at the door, and it desires you that it can rule over you. This is letting him know that sin is the problem, Cain. Sin wants to overtake you. This is why your countenance has fallen. This is why you're angry. Because sin, as a ferocious beast, is crouching, is the translation on that, crouching at your door. It desires to overtake you and lead you into destruction. But instead of that, you need to overtake that beast called sin. 
Don't let that beast rule you. You need to rule over the beast. You need the victory over the beast. The scripture lets us know over in Romans, hallelujah, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't let sin have its way. You have the victory over sin instead of sin having the victory over you because sin comes to destroy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We find in St. John chapter 10, verse 10, hallelujah, the thief comes not but for to kill and steal and destroy, and he uses sin to do it. Jesus said, but I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Oh, glory to God. This is important because God says that this is a matter of sin. Oh, glory to God. Now, we see in the offerings that uh, Abel specifically brought the firstling. He gave God the first and the best. That principle here is already long before Moses comes with the law having to do with tithing and so on. And long before the law written by Moses, the law in principle is already established in their hearts that you bring God your best and your first. Not only in terms of the offering plate, but our life is an offering. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you or I beg you, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. That's your ultimate offering. Our whole body, our whole being, which is our reasonable service. Hallelujah. That's our reasonable act of worship to give God our whole body. Romans there 12 and 1. And look how verse 2 of Romans chapter 12 fits in. And don't be conformed or fit the mold of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that we may do and prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. So the offering must be the first and the best. That's important in worship. And then the attitude must be one that is love and honor toward God. We find here in the lesson seven things going on with Cain that contributed to the problem. Number one, he was unfaithful in his worship because he brought an offering, but nothing there says that it was the firstling or the best or uh, uh, giving God the ultimate as a sacrifice to him. He brought what he brought. And we need to know God's not under obligation to take whatever we feel like giving him. Hallelujah. And then secondly, the attitude. While he's in worship, he has jealousy against his brother. His brother came with a heart of purity, gave God his first and best, and was received. And he looked at somebody else's worship, Cain did, looked at his brother's worship and became jealous of what was happening with his brother. That's always trouble because jealousy, the Bible says, is as cruel as the grave. Oh, bless his name. We must not be jealous against how God is dealing with or blessing our brother or sister. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Never must we be jealous of the worship and the relationship our brothers and sisters have with the Lord. Instead, we ask, Lord, I want to draw near. I want to draw nigh. I want to draw closer. I want to walk in obedience so I can know you in a richer way. My brother or sister's life is inspiring me that I need to seek you the more. That's the right response rather than anger against our brother. Oh, glory to God. My Lord. So then we find we go down to the next area. We're here in verse 8. Hallelujah. And Cain talked with Abel. Now, worship service is over. This is after church is over. Amen. And Cain is talking with his brother. And it came to pass that when they were in the field. Ah. Hallelujah. Now, we don't know how they ended up there. I don't know whether this was a premeditated thing on the part of Cain. Hallelujah. We had this thing planned. We don't know whether he wanted to try to kind of get him away from everybody. It sounds like that may be part of it because worship is over. Cain is still angry and he's jealous. Hallelujah. Because he didn't do right. God has challenged him about his sin. And nowhere in this passage do we see that Cain ever repented. We don't see anywhere ever where the Lord was dealing with it. He said, Lord, I didn't do right. Help me to repent. I, I, I acknowledge that I'm wrong. I acknowledge my jealousy. Never do we see that. 
now after the Lord has, he's had this situation at worship, God has talked to him and warned him about sin. Now he's out apparently somewhere private with his brother. And look what happens. And Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. Wow. Not just an argument, not just uh, 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 an intense uh, moment there. He kills his brother. My God. And here now, we go from him having an unfaithful attitude in worship, and next thing you know, he's got jealousy uh, in worship, and now he's engaged in this situation where he's not responding, where God is convicting him. His heart is hard against the Lord convicting him. That's number three. Now, number four, murder enters in the picture. Precious saints, sin multiplies. When we don't deal with one sin, it multiplies into another one. So if we don't deal with our worship, then we end up in jealousy, and then we end up with this unrepentant heart, and now murder! Oh, bless his name. God help us today. Then we come to verse 9, and the Lord comes back to Cain. God gives him so many chances. The Lord comes to Cain and says, Cain, where's your brother? This is a beautiful opportunity for Cain to have had a repentant heart and said, Lord, my brother, I I didn't deal with my anger and so on and so on, and I, I killed my brother. I, I have to admit my sin. Cain didn't do that. Now he's entered into another problem. Now he's lying to the Holy Ghost. He's lying to God himself. We know if you haven't uh, read that passage, please read Acts chapter 5. A husband and wife team, Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Spirit of God and they died that very day. Look at verse 9. And the Lord says to Cain, Cain, where's Abel, your brother? Where's your brother? And here's how Cain responds. Cain says, I know not. I don't know where he is. That's a lie. That's problem number five. Never lie. Oh, my God. He lies. And then he goes on. Not only has lying now entered in, but he is also disrespectful and dishonoring the God supposedly he was worshiping a few verses later when he not only answers God's question by saying, uh, I don't know where my brother is. Now he sarcastically says to, to the Lord, am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to know where he is? Hallelujah. He's a grown man. Why are you asking me where you We must never have a dishonorable, disrespectful attitude toward God. Oh, precious saints. Look at this. Look at verse 10. And it says, and he said, what have you done? God is talking to Cain now. He responds to Cain. He could have judged him right then, took his life, but God didn't. The Lord says, Cain, what have you done? This is another opportunity for Cain to come clean, but he doesn't take it. The Lord says, what have you done? God says the voice, listen to this, the voice of your brother's blood is crying out from the earth unto me. God can hear the voice of the shed blood of Abel. And this is symbolic because the scripture says that life is in the blood. So symbolically, uh, uh, Abel has died, the life out of Abel, his blood in the ground. That life is calling out to God. Oh, glory to God. And it's very interesting if we look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24, we're not going to turn to it. But that scripture speaks about um, in uh, Hebrews 12 and 24 that the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of Abel. Hallelujah. The voice of one cried for justice and retribution. So to speak, the blood of Abel from the ground is crying out for there to be some vindication of the fact that he's been murdered, crying out that there be justice and that uh, there be some a retribution because his life has been taken. Hallelujah. But Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross that also entered the ground, Jesus' blood cried out for reconciliation and peace. The blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of Abel. Uh, it says there in Hebrews, because Jesus shed his blood so there could be reconciliation between God and man and peace made, hallelujah, where sin had created separation. Isn't that beautiful? Praise God. And this particular note comes from a commentary called Ellicott's. A commentary. Amen. Beautiful description of how the blood cries out from the ground. Then we look 
at verse 11 and it says, now you are cursed from the earth. Judgment now is falling on Cain. Never repented, never repented, never repented, never repented. Amen. Now judgment comes. You are cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth. Amen. And uh, received the blood, uh, your brother's blood from your hand. Look at verse 12. When you till the ground before, you've been a farmer and you would till the ground and the ground would respond. The earth would respond to you and give you her strength in terms of the great produce uh, that you would reap from the earth. That great harvest. But look what's going to happen. Verse 12. When you till the ground, it shall not henceforth going forward. It's not going to yield to you uh, her strength. Hallelujah. So you're not going to succeed like you did before. Next, look at the next one. You're going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. Fugitive, we know, is someone who is on the run. Oh, often fugitives from justice, what have you. But the fugitive cannot settle down because they're on the run. And he says a vagabond. A vagabond is a wanderer, a drifter. They're just from place to place to place and they never settle down. So you're going to be on the run and having to drift and drift and no longer be able to settle down. Wow. Wow. And look at this. Uh, verse 13. And Cain says unto the Lord, he still is not repenting. Look what he's talking about. My and I, he's still focused on himself. Here's Cain's response in verse 13. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Self, self, me, my, I, Lord, have mercy. He has killed his brother and still not repenting of that. But now that God has judged him, at least the Lord let him live. God is judging. This punishment is too great. Tell me this. If you kill someone, how great of a judgment is too much. You've taken a life. Hallelujah. And so look here that what the Lord says in verse 14. Behold, you have driven. This is the Cain continuing to respond to God. My punishment is too much. It's more than I can bear. Verse 14. Behold, you've driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from your face. We'll talk about that. And uh, your face, shall, from your face, I'm going to be hidden. So you've driven me from the face of the earth and from your face. He says, and I'm going to be a fugitive and I'm going to be a vagabond on the earth. He's repeating back to God what God said the judgment's going to be. And he says, and it's going to come to pass that everyone that finds me, they're going to want to kill me. That's another evidence. There's multitude of people on the earth. Amen. So uh, the, it, it couldn't be that there's all these people. Everybody's going to try to slay me if there's nobody on the earth but Adam and Eve. And now just came, just the three people. No, there are a multitude of people. Because everybody that sees me is going to want to kill me, right? To uh, make him pay for having slain his brother. Look at verse 15, the mercy of God. Hallelujah. Because our lesson is about ju judgment and justice and vengeance but also mercy. Oh, blessed be God. Look at verse 15. And the Lord says to him, therefore, whoever will slay Cain, vengeance is going to be on him. God's showing mercy to Cain. Uh, vengeance is going to be on him, taken sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anybody that finding him should kill him. So the Lord put a mark on Cain to preserve him. Notice some other principles here. Oh, we covered uh, these various things in Cain. Number one, unfaithful in his worship. Number two, the jealousy that was in his heart. Number uh, three, he was unrepentant when the Lord uh, came to him and inquired of him. Number four, he becomes a murderer. Number five, he lies to God. Number six, he dishonors and disrespects God in his conversation. And number seven, when God even brings a judgment upon him, he doesn't recognize the mercy God is showing him and be grateful. But instead, in his selfishness, he resists even his judgment. Wow. Wow. Cain never repented. Now, this issue here in verse 14 about uh, having to run from the face of the earth and also being hidden from the face of God. This part about uh, the face of the earth uh, can be two things. One, that the earth will no longer yield unto him. Uh, the other one had to do with the fact that he will have to be a fugitive and run all over the earth. He will never be able 
it, the face of the earth being against him, not only not yielding its fruits, but the face of the earth won't even receive him to let him settle down, build a home, establish himself, have a, a, a place that's a steady home. No, the face of the earth will even reject him so he can't stay anywhere any length of time. He has to wander and he has to be a drifter all the rest of the days of his life. But because of the mercy of God, he has this mark so that he will not be killed. Wow. All of us, in a way, are represented by Cain. All of these seven characteristics. And the greatest of all is though we've sinned, God has loved us, shown us mercy. The greatest mercy, we can be reconciled to God if we just receive his son, Jesus Christ. If any of you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord, what a perfect day to do so. The first Sunday of the brand new year. All we have to do is admit, Lord, I'm a sinner and I know I am. Forgive me. Wash me, cleanse me, change me. I believe Jesus is your son and he died to pay the penalty for my sin. He died in my place. I believe he buried, but he rose again. He's alive. Oh, yes, he is. He's not just another man. He's God in human form. And I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I leave my old life behind. I receive Jesus. I'm going to follow him. Hallelujah. Just pray that prayer with sincere heart. The Lord will love and receive you. And you will become what the Bible calls being born again. The Lord will transform you. Need to join a Bible-believing, preaching, and teaching church. There are many all over the land. Hallelujah. Join a church, praise God. Consider the church of God in Christ, although there are many others that preach and teach the word, so you can be in a family. Any newborn baby needs to be with a family to care for them. Teach them the way of the life of God. And now, our Bible spotlight for today. Our spotlight today is about the principle in the scripture of something called the second son. Um, we see throughout the scripture, and we'll just mention seven instances of it, where the first son had a calling as the firstborn uh, son to fulfill uh, their assignment and role in the family, which is to be leadership upon the passing of the father uh, and to protect and to lead and provide and to guide and love the family uh, in the absence of the father. But there are multiple instances where the first son failed, but God raised up the second son. Um, and we'll see that principle when we get to number seven. But let me give you a few of the examples. One is in today's lesson. The first son was king, but he lost his blessing. Hallelujah, by his hardness of heart, and Abel had the blessing. We see another set of sons, and these are the sons uh, Esau and Jacob. Um, and with Esau, he was the firstborn, but he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Hallelujah. Not honoring the things of God, more concerned about his flesh. And Jacob, the second son, got the blessing. We also see with the sons of Abraham, the first son, Ishmael, uh, was Abraham's son, but he was the work and the product of the flesh, whereas Isaac was the son of promise, and in his name the seed should be called, and the blessing again was on the second son. Another example that we see in the scripture actually comes over into uh, the New Testament where in Matthew chapter 21, verse 28, Jesus gives a parable and says a certain man had two sons. And he said to the first son, son, go work in my vineyard. He said, yes, dad, I'll do it. But he did not. And then he came to the second son and said, son, go work in the vineyard. No, I'm not going. I'm not going. But later he repented and he went. And Jesus inquired, he asked the question, who really did the will of the Father? The first one that said, I'll go, willingly agreed, but did not? Or the second son, who even though initially he didn't, ultimately he did obey his father. We also have the story of the prodigal son in St. Luke chapter 15. And there we find uh, that the older son stayed home. The younger son, the second son, uh, went his way and went into a far country. We know the story there. Hallelujah. Fell into great trouble and uh, was in great sin. And then he came back home in repentance and was restored to his father. The older brother was the one that had contention and hardness of heart. Father had to really work with him so that the younger son experienced with his father that restoration after his repentance coming to himself and coming back home. Oh, glory to God. We see all of these examples here. Cain and Abel. 
Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob, hallelujah. Another example is amongst the sons of Jacob, his firstborn actually was Reuben, but the first son by the wife he really uh, desired, Rachel, was Joseph. And Joseph there is symbolic again of the second son. The blessing fell on Joseph. Reuben lost his blessing. He was, his father said, unstable as water. He went in unto his father's concubine, hallelujah. But the blessing fell on Joseph, that second son. Well, the ultimate case, Adam was the first son, but Jesus is the last Adam, not the second Adam, as though there might be a third and a fourth, but Jesus is declared to be the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. And whereas the initial Adam, the first Adam failed, the last Adam, did the will of his father. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Father, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. We glorify you for this powerful lesson. Transform us and make us what you'd have us to be. For this, we give you praise. Glory to God and amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Until next time. <laughs>